Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Collector's Conversation. This is a great episode. I got three fairly new collectors, and that's pretty much the theme of today's show is uh, folks who have recently joined the hobby. I know many of us have joined the last 10 years, but I think I think I got a group of folks who kind of like uh, just right above that rookie stage. They're probably like in probably around the year three or year four collecting. And uh, one of them is the previous uh, guest on Comic Art Live. So we're, I'm, I look forward, or actually two of them are actually previous guests. So I look forward to see where their collection is now. So my first guest is uh, Robert Berman. You may have met Robert at uh, OAX or, or Heroes um, and, or some other cons. So uh, thanks for coming on, Robert. Thank you, Larry. Next guest is uh, Carl Choi. Um, he's been around for a while. He's been on a collector's conversation quite a while ago, I guess around uh, the first season. And, yeah, been uh, <laughs> and uh, my third guest is uh, Simon. Um, he is uh, he is also he's done a collector's interview uh, very early on. I, guess, I think it's been about maybe three or four years uh, since yeah. he had the collector's interview. And I invited him because I'm actually really looking forward to hear where his collection is or where his mindset is, you know, since that last collector's conversation. All right. So um, I'm going to first start. I know, I know many of you have actually had a conversation with Bill about your origin story. So let's give the audience a recap of where there is. Let's Robert, let's, let's start with you. When did you first start collecting? What were like what year and, and what was your first purchase? Right. So I'm actually just past that four year uh, spring of uh, 2019. Uh, I had, I had been, looking at uh, art at uh, Dragon Con made me aware that there were artists that sold art to the public. And so I was looking at websites in the spring of 2019 on Paul Smith's website, uh, where you know he throws up uh, sketches in the middle of the night. I happened to log on at just the right time and managed to get a Saturn Girl sketch. A Saturn Girl sketch. So Paul wow. Smith, who was a childhood favorite. So that was great. Wait, you say your first sketch was by Paul Smith? Yes. Wow, that's a that's a pretty good start. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty uh, pretty exciting, and uh, I didn't at the time know how hard it was to get one by him. I just happened to be logging in, and oh, is that a girl? I'll take that. Wow, in incredible! And was Dragon Con your first con? Uh, yes, I had been going even before I was a collector to hang out with friends, and then I started going to the art area, and that got me kind of you know you, you go through the different stages of thinking about doing something before you do it, and it was probably a year or two. Of being aware there was art before I, I actually tried to buy any there. Uh, but that fall 2019 was when I started getting commissions and seeing what old art was for sale. And people like Colleen Doran were there and Barry Kitson and Mike Grell. Wow. So let me ask you, were you a comic collector before you became a comic art collector? Uh, as a kid, I read uh, and uh, then high school hit and needing to pay for gas and in the mid 80s, buying compact discs was expensive. So I stopped uh, comic books then started reading uh, uh, hardback collections again in the late 90s, early 2000s. All right. OK, but but right before you were um, buying art, you weren't like collecting books. You weren't like collecting graded books or your. No, no, nothing like that. Oh. Okay, so you pretty much you saw this, and then it was like you, you you saw this new hobby, and it was just an addiction right away. Okay. Yep. Yep. All right. Pretty much. <laughs> um, do you, uh, just one last question before I move on, Robert? Do you do you currently read books? Uh, yes, I do. I don't I don't read individual books. I wait till they come out in a in a collected form of some sort. Uh, mm -hmm. But that's a good way to find new art. So new books. So when you started collecting it was co collecting comic art did that that sort of like restarted your interest in reading comic books um I, I would say i had already restarted but it i would say it fueled my interest in in reading new stuff okay got it <laughs> thanks all right carl um when did you first start uh buying art and what was your first purchase hey larry thanks for having me um first purchase was new york comic con 2017 and it was at the Bernard Chang booth. And, and the reason uh, I bought something from him was because I had met him at a dinner that summer. And then it just happened to be running into him again when I was at New York Comic Con. And then uh, as we're chatting, uh, he had 
you know, his portfolio in front of him and I started flipping through them. And I'm like, what's this? And he's like, oh, my original art. And I said, you could buy original art. And, you know, obviously I flipped through and saw some of the pages he did on Nightwing. I ended up buying a couple of those pages. And then instantly I had like a shot of nostalgia. I was like, I wonder who else is here. And I went down um, the aisle and I saw Ron Lim. And he had all these like Infinity uh, Gauntlet pages out. And so I was looking at them. I was like, oh my God, I just bought a couple of pages from Bernard Chang for like $100, 100 $150. But then these are like two, three thousand dollars Oh my gosh, right? But it's pretty funny because one of the splashes I wanted to buy, I think it was asking $2,500, ended up like selling on like Heritage like two weeks later for like six, seven thousand dollars. So I thought that was a very funny moment for me to learn. Uh, you know, when you see something you love, uh, grab it right away because it might show up in auction for four times more. Uh, but yeah, that's kind of how I started. Oh, Carl, looks like you have a question. Marcus, I was. <laughs> I landed last night and then I'll be in San Francisco starting tomorrow. Wow. How long is the flight from uh, Singapore to where you are? Uh, wasn't as bad uh, coming back. So from I did a stopover. So you kind of don't want to do like a direct because it's... Um, <laughs> very expensive and also on top of that uh it's like a almost a 20 hour flight and so i try to break it up so you go to korea for about five hours and then it's 11 hours coming back oh i see, I see. well 20 hours yeah roughly okay. it was 17 hours coming back so it wasn't bad <laughs> okay all right simon we'll start with you again um yeah. where was uh what 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 when what year did you start and what was your first uh, piece yeah, I was just looking back at my collection on CAF, and it seems the first time I posted something was July of 2020. Um, it was an amazing Spider-Man uh, page by Mark Bagley from issue 375, I think. And I just found it on eBay. But subsequently, like right before that, I had gone to one of my local comic book shops, and the owner of the shop, uh, I don't know how we got to talking about original art, but he pulled out a folder of original art that he had. And I'd always been aware of commissions beforehand, and I've gotten a number of commissions for years beforehand. Uh, but the idea of original art had never really entered my mind uh, until he pulled out this folder and, I, and started flipping through the pages and everything that he owned. And I was like, you know, turned on a light bulb in my head. I was mystified. Um, so I just decided to just go for what I really enjoyed that day, which ended up being uh, Mark Bagley's Spider-Man Venom uh, page. Uh, which I got for what was then really cheap uh, for now would be quite a bit more. And um, that's from there, it just became like uh, kind of an addiction almost. Wait, um, did you discover calf before you bought your first piece? I might have. I'm not really sure the order of events, um, but I, I think I discovered art before I discovered calf. But I'm not sure mm -hmm. if I discovered that page that I bought before I discovered calf. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. and, and your first art piece was from Amazing Spider-Man 375. And that, that's a yeah. pretty key issue. Yeah, it was. Uh, I love that <laughs> issue. There was, a, there was a page on Comic Connect just uh, earlier today, a couple hours ago from that same issue, which I did not get. It went um, above my price range, but I was very much tempted. Yeah. Um, so I can see, so I see now what those kind of pages go for these days, uh, which is if I ever decide to sell something, then who knows? Uh, so... I'm just gonna. I'm just so curious. You first see Amazing Spider-Man 375 on the web on eBay. Now I know mm -hmm. 375. You're not gonna get that for a thousand dollars. Even in 2020, when you when you were buying, I mean, 375. You're buying a page. You're spending several uh, a couple thousand dollars on. Yeah, and, it was. And, and I, you were just like, oh, it's my first purchase. I'm just gonna go like bang right there. Pretty, drop, drop pretty much. Uh, I didn't see any other. Uh, I didn't at the time know how to look uh, for art otherwise other than eBay. Uh -huh. and I wasn't aware of like the auction houses and all that stuff, Heritage and Comic League and all that stuff. So that was the only resource I had. And I knew when I was going into the hobby that I wanted Spider Man and Mark Bagley. Everything else would come later, but that's what I wanted to start off my collection with. Oh, nice. Um, so that's what I, I typed it in. I found it. Um, and it was, I don't mind saying it was, I think, $4,000 at the time. Uh -huh. and I think it was like it's also a partial splash of like the new, of Silver Sable's new Wild Pack or whatever, along with Venom and Spider Man in the bottom panels. Uh, so it's kind of almost like a first appearance page, I think, as well. Um, so, yeah. Wow. I mean, I know when I started 
I wasn't making four thousand dollars on my first paycheck. <laughs> so when I when I when I, when I was third first collecting, so to go out and just buy a four thousand page four thousand dollar page at the beginning, and now of course that page is worth a lot more now. Yeah. But yeah. Wow. This just no, yeah, it's just it's a big deal. It's a big deal for me. And then afterwards, I went for a lot of smaller pages, like a couple hundred dollar pages, whatever. Mm -hmm. So it took a lot of internal navigating to figure out: Do I really want this? Am I going to start going down this road? Um, and if not, at least I'd have a great Spider-Man page for one of my favorite Spider-Man issues for one of my favorite artists. So, and what, what? How did you feel when you saw the Heritage? He goes, "That half splash went for thirty-six thousand dollars on Heritage." Uh, yeah, it's pretty crazy to see the prices that things are going for these days. I think, um, especially in auction houses, people just keep bidding up on things, and it just kind of, yeah. So. And I feel like I entered the hobby a little, I, everyone says this, but I feel like I entered the hobby a little too late. Mm -hmm. And that had I had the wherewithal uh, to start collecting a few years prior to when I did, like these guys did, uh, I might have been able to get even more uh, awesome pieces for a reasonable sum. So, but I just, just the where I'm going at is, so you see one of your pages, because 375, I, I have to say that's probably something, a book that means a lot to you for you to just, you know, throw out you know go throw a whole big amount on in your first page and you yeah. see a page another page and that book goes for thirty six thousand. was your first thought wow i don't know if i can you know get more pages from this book or or was it wow my my page is probably worth a lot of money now so the space the page that you're talking about i think that was from a year ago maybe from mm -hmm. asm 374 i think it was a spider-man and or mm -hmm. venom punching spider-man in mid-flight or whatever Mm -hmm. um long story short i actually did try and get that page um <laughs> but i it, things didn't work out um but that wasn't necessarily hmm. i have noticed that mark bagley spider-man pages have started to go up in price over the past few years especially once mm -hmm. COVID hit um but still my my general mentality is just uh, I hope that something won't go for thirty six thousand dollars. I hope something won't go for forty thousand dollars. I hope it'll stay at a reasonable price. Mm. And if it doesn't, um, and if it's not within my budget, then so be it. <laughs> um, like tonight, a uh, comic co couple uh, pages on Comic Connect that I really wanted from a couple Spider Man issues. Um, they just weren't in the budget at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if it's a matter of life and death, I'm sure I could get them, but it wasn't. So, <laughs> um, okay. yeah. All right. Uh, Mikhail ha sorry, Mikhail had a great question for the group, and I'd like to hear, Robert, how did you discover CAF? That is a good question. I don't even remember. I know. I think I was on CAF for about a year before I bought anything. That that helped to fuel my interest that that art buying art was even a choice. And I, I wish I could answer that question. <laughs> Carl, how did you discover calf? I'm trying to remember as well. I'm, I'm trying to think of it. It's like maybe, maybe through Felix because, um, I was kind of tracking through my journey where after Bernard, I bought those pages. Then I used to always hang out at Jerry Ma's booth at New mm -hmm. York comic con. And that's also where I met Walt Simonson, who's Jerry's mentor. And then next to him at the time was Cliff Chang. And so him, Cliff and I started chit-chatting about Paper Girls. And I remember uh, he was like, oh, I have to go. I'm going to my art reps uh, dinner. And I was like, oh, what's that? And then is that like your manager? And he's like, oh, no, he just reps and, and promotes us. And so check out his website, Felix Comic Art. And so I did. And I feel like in the midst of all his emails and whatnot, he referenced CAF. And that's how I found it. But I need to think a little bit more on exactly how how it happened ah okay simon how well, how did you discover calf so it was a very elementary way of discovering it uh so once i bought the spider-man page uh -huh. i thought to myself how do i find out more about original artwork so i literally just type in how to collect original art how to collect, like original comic art and really just google provided <laughs> power of google yeah <laughs> Oh, I mean, yeah, if you're searching for original art, I mean, I'm sure CAF is probably the top. Yeah, exactly. So by it was probably time, Google for me as well. By mm. by time of 2020, CAF is already running to almost, for almost like 20 years. So, mm. um, and uh, yeah, the repository in CAF is pretty huge. Yeah, I, I think I I think I found out CAF through this Comic Art L list. And I don't remember how I got on the Comic Art L. I, mm. I don't really understand how. I don't, it's all that so long ago. 
But uh, I, I think from Comic RL, then I discovered Cav pretty quickly. All right. All right, guys. Uh, thanks uh, for telling your origin story. Um, so we'll go on to the next question. So no matter when any of us started, we all wish that we started earlier. And I assume most of us transitioned from comics to art. I think, well, except Robert. Robert apparently discovered art on his own. And it was like, wow, this is so cool. So I guess the, the question is, was it a real lifestyle change when you started collecting comic art? I know for myself it, it was, but but Simon, I'm gonna start with you. Was it a big lifestyle change when you started collecting comic art? It was because before I was really aware of original published comic art, I spent most of my time with comics and commissions because I didn't realize there was a level above commissions or yeah. So I would go for like, uh, the high ratio comic variants, whatever, from back in the day. I'd go for just commissions I get from various artists that I enjoy, like at various comic book conventions. Um, and then once I entered into collecting comic art, I kind of thought to myself, oh man, I've not necessarily wasted, but wasted all of this time and money on commissions and variant covers, variant comic books, when I could have just gotten straight to the source and been buying this awesome stuff for, yeah, reasonable prices back then, at least they would have been. Um, so since then, I guess there's been a shift. I don't do commissions as much, very rarely. Um, I don't do uh, variant covers that much, or I don't really collect um, or buy comics themselves in mass like I used to. Um, Got to kind of divide everything up and set a budget aside for everything now. Um, yeah. So you pretty much, and I know you're not the only one, Pretty much whatever disposable income you had, it was went to went, went goes to comic art. Yeah, these days, yeah. Um, <laughs> back in the day, it went to again variant covers and okay. mostly just comics. Yeah, like the stuff you get from Midtown Comics or whatever. Because um, I was really into comics. I still, I mean, I still am, but I don't uh -huh. collect them nearly as uh, aggressively as I used to. Because again, I wasn't really aware of comic art, uh -huh. and I thought that it didn't really go beyond like a one in one hundred or one in one thousand variant cover. Uh -huh. um, so that's what I really pursued and sought after. But when I learned the error of my ways, such as it were, then I just uh, did a complete shift. Okay. Yeah. Carl, Carl, what about you? Is Has it been a big lifestyle change since you discovered uh, comic art? Mm, it's different. I mean, I don't know if the lifestyle change. I think because I work in the creative industries, I've always uh -huh. been uh really big in deploying capital to invest in artists if you could call it that you know kind of deploying just to support creatives mm -hmm. so i worked in music for many years and then film and tv and a lot of times i always try to support creatives as much as i can and i think the journey kind of started that way too just seeing that mm -hmm. and i was selling some of the stuff then meeting cliff he's such a cool guy then went to his next drop and bought some paper girl stuff mm -hmm. and then i would say yeah i think it was that way for a few years and I don't think it was until more recent years where I started moving deeper into stuff that I've been nostalgic about. So uh -huh. I think I think in recent years my life has changed more than you know early on comic art collecting because of okay, years, right. just supporting talent. So it's taken a couple because I know you have like sort of like a valiant focus and or something that that was one of the things you were collecting. You were a big valiant collector. Um, yeah, I, I, it was a lot of Valiant and even specifically from Bernard and Sean Chen, who are like two artists that I grew up uh, fanboying over and also mm -hmm. get to know in person. Because I actually met Sean when I used to run an agency and he was in the agency business and you know, I hired him for some work. And then that's kind of how we, we really connected. So when he had art that would pop up on eBay or wherever, I would mm -hmm. just buy it up, especially Valiant art. Mm -hmm. All right. But so now are you like all in on art? Uh, I don't know if I'm all in. I think uh, I definitely am more selective. Uh, mm -hmm. I was buying, uh, you know, one of the, the themes early on was, you know, full issues of, of the talent that I would come across and, and liked. And so uh, I think a lot of it was Felix artists because I would meet them at his booth and then mm -hmm. they would just be really good people. Uh, I think I think it was Trad at first and then uh, Dan Warren Johnson. And then I would really go deep in, in their in their stuff for a while. And then they would get really expensive. And then uh, I would kind of shift uh, as I see things that are a little bit more affordable, I would move that direction. But in the recent years, I would say the last year and a half or so, I started shifting towards more nostalgic artists. So uh, I think you see some Barry Windsor Smith uh, mm -hmm. Valiant stuff. That's definitely one moment of my 
um, I guess, comic reading career that uh, really pulled me in. And then I'm obviously looking at some other stuff. But uh, yeah, I think it's definitely changed more recently because I think just the general prices of uh, newer art has caught mm -hmm. up to some of the stuff I'm nostalgic about. So in that case, I figure, oh, I have enough new art. I should start getting some of the more nostalgic stuff into my collection. Got it. Uh, yes, Robert. Jay, oh, on a Kool-Aid drinker. <laughs> <laughs> For a few years there, for sure. <laughs> yeah. So, Robert, what about you? How how quickly did did art become like the primary session of your life? Oh, um, well, I I don't even see it as that now, frankly. Um, certainly with respect to the main mm -hmm. thing that it's changed is how I spend sort of chunks of time. Like before, I collected art. I didn't plan during my year. Okay, I need time to go to Heroes Con or to mm -hmm. Como or to OAX things like that. Uh, and so now doing things like, you know, during OAX and, and MegaCon was the following weekend. So we had a family vacation at Disney mm -hmm. the week between. So it has that kind of impact as far as my, my schedule. Mm -hmm. um, and then doing, doing things like this and, you know, everybody knows with art, it takes time to, uh, you know, curate your art as well. Um, uh, so time-wise, yes, it's, uh, changed my life to some degree. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, not so much as far as like organizing my finances around it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have a wife, I have kids, uh, I have a, a lot of other financial goals that I'm pushing towards uh, in my, my business and my personal life. Uh, you know, I, I, I wouldn't want to like, you know, my, my church needs something. They have this project going on. I'd say, oh, I would really like to give, but you know, I just bought an X-Man page. Sorry. <laughs> So what I guess when I I guess I guess I mentioned money when when really that's not really factor it's how much how much how much does OA consume the, your your mind so when you have that when you have that free oh, time sure. how much do you think about art and like looking at look at calf I know that there's some folks who browse calf multiple times every single day and they're and they're always looking at what's what's new what's available and and then there are also some folks who is like. I wonder where that piece is. How do I find that piece? Who am I going to ask to find that piece? So, does does do those kinds of thought like sort of like run through your head like constantly? Yeah, that's a it's a common part of the headspace. <laughs> Carl, is that for you too, or or is, is it? I know you have a lot of business going on, so I don't know how much between car, art and business, you know. No, I was consume. thinking. I mean, actually, the biggest impact it had on my life was, uh, and I don't know how much of an impact it had like directly, yeah. but. I think a big part of it inspired me to become a comic book publisher because mm -hmm. as I got to know some of these artists, um, you know, I would hire, I mean, a couple of them actually have books with our company now uh, because I was buying their art. And so mm -hmm. I think there was some influence on, on how my lifestyle changed for sure. Okay. So, I mean, Simon, does, does it, does it consume your headspace in terms of five? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, because in a way it's almost like gambling in the sense that you can easily just uh, drop twenty thousand, thirty thousand, fifty thousand dollars on something, and just when you look at the numbers like on Heritage, it looks like these tiny little numbers. It doesn't really like take up uh, residence in your mind. But then after the fact, you're like, oh my mm -hmm. god, I just spent fifty thousand dollars. How am I going to pay rent, or I have to save uh, for the next half a year or whatever? Mm -hmm. And I, I can't speak for everyone else, but I'm not like a multimillionaire. I, I'm not getting the uh, ASF 300 covers every week or something. Um, so I think most people just have to just work within a budget um, because it's easy to blow one's proverbial load like early in the year. Like once this, the auction start and everything, all that, all the shows start and everything, you got to pace yourself uh, as I've, as I learned early on, because uh, it's a, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint because there's always going to be something you want. Um, if you drop ten thousand, however much is a lot to you on one thing, then a couple of weeks later, inevitably something else is going to come up that you want, and then you have to somehow figure out, do the mental math, like if uh, how do I get this? Is it super important to me? And you just have to do all those kind of calculations. So just budgeting yourself is something that I uh, think about a lot. <laughs> <laughs> wrong because every time i buy a piece i contemplate how many more months i have to work for <laughs> retirement <laughs> to pay for it <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah um you know like I, I i've been in this hobby for quite a while i know some folks and and some of the folks they're just every every minute is thinking about art and and 
honestly, they uh, from, from from just co being committed to art all the time, they create this big network of friends because because anything that comes up, they 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 always they always you know talk about it and ask about it, and they're always obsessed looking and and the uh, every day is like an option. It's like which piece am I going to buy? There's like 200 options of art every single day that comes up. Yeah, I would yeah, say it's, art it's, really it's, it's probably in my top five interests, but not my top three. Well, Robert, I'm glad to hear that you have other priority. I think we all need to sort of, sort of, sort of like like prioritize things. I think some folks maybe take it a little way extreme, um, but I think I think it's it's great to hear that actually some folks are actually there's some other priority there. I need to prioritize the thing that actually can fund the art that I'm buying. So. Yeah, the priorities I think are a big thing. Like you need to prioritize, <laughs> prioritize having food on the table. You need to prioritize taking your cat to the vet. You need to prioritize a bunch of stuff, and it's really easy to lose yourself down the rabbit hole again. I'm going to spend a hundred grand today, and not think about it until after I do it, and then oh my god, what am I going to do with my life? Um, yeah, again, Robert. Yeah, like gambling. <laughs> yeah, no, Robert. But this is not your top three. I, I I hate to see what your top three hobbies look like because I, I got the <laughs> oh, well. I mean, I wasn't including. Kids. I was being included as hobbies. I mean, you know, as as far as things I think about, you know, uh -huh. I think about my family, I think about my work, I think about my my religious life, I think about my health, I think uh -huh. about my you know my comic book hobbies. Nice. Well, Robert, I'm glad the comic art doesn't compromise any of that. Well, maybe sometimes I do, like when it comes to donations and things like that. <laughs> All right, so um, we're going to talk about the first collection theme. So, Carl. What was your first collection theme? Well, how, how did you how did you start out? You know, in your collection, if you had a focus. Yeah, I think it was funny. I I, I literally would just follow Felix Drop. I would read the comics that these art was coming from, and then if I liked the comics, I would go in on on the pages. So that was my initial theme, and then I think then I went into uh, characters, which I think is very common. Uh, I got into Wolverine, obviously. Got some Batman. Got a lot of Thanos, maybe because at the time it was like the movies. Uh, bought a bunch of Deadpool, and then and then and then eventually, really got into Nova and a lot of the cosmic stuff for some reason. Because I remember growing up really loving uh, reading Nova, and then uh, yeah, that was my initial theme. And then and then I start, I think, shifting more of an artist collector uh, when when Trad Moore and Darren Warren Johnson happened. And I started buying pretty deep into their stuff. And then I think it was one of the first four issues that I bought. It must have been from Jeff Shaw, I think. It was like crossover number three or four. Oh, no, it was one of the Thor issues. It was like Thor Thor 14. And then once I got that full issue, I, I kind of caught a full issue bug. And so complete stories and full issues became a theme for for probably majority of my collecting uh, over the mm -hmm. last like. Five, six years. Well, actually, wow, 2017, 18, so six years now. Oh, wow. So are you still buying complete issues or did you uh, shift from that? A lot more selective. I was definitely uh, buying whatever full issue I really liked for a while. Mm -hmm. And then I uh, realized I had way too many pages because uh, <laughs> storage became an issue. And so I just started becoming a little more selective. So I focus more on like number ones now, or if it's like mm -hmm. an issue I really love the story for, I would do that. Uh, and then, but now I think because of storage capacity issues and because of the price of the full issues have substantially increased over the course of the last like four or five years, uh, I, I started shifting to nostalgia now. So mm -hmm. I think the first major nostalgia piece I bought was uh, the cover for Unity number one uh, by Barry Windsor Smith. And, and ever since that moment, I think my whole like collecting thesis have, have shifted to what I loved growing up versus what I'm loving now, which, which I, I, did, I don't, I haven't stopped. I still read comics now. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think, I think priority wise is definitely more the stuff I grew up to. Yeah, Carl. I mean, you're saying the complete issue, the value of complete issues keeps going up. I, I have no, no, I have no anything about it. You're the only person I know who buys complete issues. So I don't know who your competitors are. <laughs> so, I don't know. Comic, they, they just keep. I mean, maybe it's because uh, maybe I'm the only one buying, and the dealers just keep it. Hey, Carl's paying this, and so I keep increasing the prices. But I definitely had to fall back a lot. I, I know a couple of guys in in our chat that are into it as well, and, and we've had similar conversations. Where after a while, it just seems like way too many pages, 
I think it's really fun when you have, have the right ones to flip through and, and, and reread these stories again without the word bubbles. Mm -hmm. uh, but after a while, like storage, uh, you know, I'm not a dealer, so like I have limited storage. And so even after I, I was able to expand some capacity here at home, I uh, got a big safe. The safe really like filled up so quickly that I realized, okay, I need to slow down and just like figure some things out. And only until this year, like I don't think I started selling anything until maybe like this year, maybe maybe late last uh -huh. year. But I, I literally have to sell because I just need to make space. Uh -huh. Okay. Robert, what, what was your first collection sort of focus or theme? I'm not sure I have one yet. Uh, okay. uh, my collection, everyone who looks at my collection says, well, you're, I mean, they're very nice about it, but they say you're very scattershot. Uh, you, you have a lot of, of different things. And, uh, and I, I do like the idea, like Carl, of having complete stories as much as it can be because comics is a sequential art form and it's a narrative art form. And it's not just, for me, it's not just, you know, about a pinup. Um, or a page that looks like it could be a pinup, um, mm -hmm. but about story. So I do, I definitely prioritize those when they seem attainable, but um, I can't say it's you know, the thing. Okay, so so your theme hasn't really changed. It's like, if if it looks nice, I'm gonna buy it. <laughs> or, or, if, or if I have some nostalgia, yeah. I'm gonna buy it. Okay. Yeah, those, kind of you know, those two certainly factor into it. Yeah, look okay. for targets of opportunity and and sometimes save up for something special. Okay. All right. Person of opportunity. Nice. Simon, what, what is yours? Was it like Ian Churchill <laughs> or was it Cable? Um, I do I do love Ian Churchill and Cable, but before that, uh, B plus B and G said something about um, if a piece comes up you really like, you might have to go for it. It might be gone forever. Um, that's a thought that I've, all, I've had many times. Um, but then I liken it to Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade where – He's hanging from the cliff. Mm -hmm. The grail is right there, literally just inches away. And he has to decide, is he going to go for it and possibly die? Or is he just has to let it go? And I think that's an apt analogy, I think, for um, the hobby that we're in. Mm -hmm. Because if you just refuse to let it go, you're going to end up paying more than you probably are comfortable doing so. So you just have to be okay with letting certain pieces go and have to rest in the knowledge that something else will invariably come up that you want probably just as badly at some point. Um, because we've all seen those things that we want pretty badly that just only pop up once in a lifetime, but we just can't have them. And that's really unfortunate and depressing and sad, but that's life sometimes. <laughs> um, Churchill stuff, going back to somebody else I asked if I like in, uh, my Churchill pieces, pieces. I love them. I love Cable. Um, he's one of my favorite superheroes, especially his design, and I love Ian Churchill's art on it. Um, the covers that I have of Cable are also the issues of which I'm trying to collect um, very strongly and heavily. But anyway, my first collection of them, uh, was, and still is, I guess, Spider-Man and Mark Bagley. Uh -huh. um, unfortunately, I've been priced out uh, these days by a lot of it, but at, at, a, at my core, that's uh -huh. um, what I started out with, and that's what I try and uh, seek out whatever I can. Uh, but I also like to just get whatever just appeals to me. I seem to mostly gravitate towards like 90s era stuff and more modern stuff. Uh -huh. um, but again, if somebody just gave me a page of, or a couple, like a stack of John Romita Mm -hmm. Spider-Man pages, I'd be ecstatic, of course. Um, but mostly 90s and modern is probably my theme, as it were. Uh -huh. Yeah, so you mentioned and you're talking about, you know, you might be missing out. But I think I think when you, when you start going from collecting comic books, when you were collecting comic books, you pretty much had an opportunity to complete everything you want. I mean, if you wanted mm -hmm. something, you could find it. Yeah, you, you could probably may have to spend a couple hundred bucks for the book you want, but you do have this sort of completionist uh, mentality when you're collecting comics. You can't complete when you're in OA unless yeah. you have huge amounts of money. So, yeah. so you have to let things go or choose your target. Be selective about it because, and it's one of one. If you have you you have to choose decide you're going to take it or let someone else take it, but you can't complete. A full, I mean, it's exactly. I mean, Carl, I mean, Carl could probably complete a full book, but most of us, we don't, we don't no, 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 it's a different issue. It's different when you buy complete in the beginning and okay. when you try to assemble something after. Because okay. I know this, it's literally probably like 3x what you would pay for a full issue up front. Because mm -hmm. I did, I am in the process of trying to assemble something, 
And uh, some of the other collectors did warn me about this of not mm -hmm. publicizing that. And I did. And all of a sudden, all those pages prices went up like triple fold. So no. it's kind of like, <laughs> it's kind of sad because when people know that someone is coming after them for a particular purpose like that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, all of a sudden it just gets more expensive. Yeah, I, I know I know folks in the hobby who've been there definitely collecting a lot longer than I have. They've been collecting probably 30, 40 years. They're still working on like that Gene Colon complete issue or, or even like a Don Heck complete issue. And they're probably three pages away. But it's it is it is it's more about where the other pages. They they they, they have ninety percent of the the book, but finding those other pages, it's not even about money. It's like where are those other pages? And sometimes it never happens. And as the Rolling Stones say, you can't always get what you want, um, no. which is just an unfortunate byproduct of the hobby. And yeah, like with comics, there's always um, hundreds or thousands, tens of thousands of a comic you can always find. Um, but with art, as we all know, there's only one of one. And you can definitely feel the sting of it if you can't have it or it can't be yours. But there's something to be said about having the ability to appreciate. Like if one of you guys were able to buy me out on a piece in an auction, I can still appreciate the art and see you guys post on calf. I can still look at it. And I think in that circumstance, that would have to be enough for me to know that I have the ability to appreciate what you guys uh, bought, out, bought me out on. And I just have to live with that. Yeah. Here you go. And what, one of the most helpful things that I heard early on, and I wish I remember who said it was every piece of art is unique, but the happiness you get from owning it is not unique. That, that there, there is another piece. Um, Oh, okay. No, I, I, I would agree with that as well, too. I mean, sometimes you're extremely happy buying maybe a $200 piece, and, and it's, it's a panel page, but it's, it's a panel page that you really love. So, all right. If you need a Eagle, Marcus says, if you need a, need the page, you can always ask for a monoprint. <laughs> so. All right. So I guess the, the next question, and then and some of you have already touched on it, uh, is, is, is your collection exploring new territories? Um, and I know Carl has sort of, uh, he's already touched on it, but, but Simon, I know you said you had sort of like a nineties theme or nineties and Spider-Man theme. Mm. Are, are you expanding into other areas in terms of looking at, Hey, you know, I, I, this, this, this new area is really interesting. I think I'm gonna start diving into it and start buying it. Example, you see Bill Sankiewicz art. You might some at uh, one point you may not like it, but later on you like you really appreciate it. Yeah, and I'd say it's uh, out of necessity I've had to do that, if only because again, like I love Jim Lee, but I can't go and buy every X Men Jim Lee page I see from the '90s. I don't even have one yet, but one day I will have a nice one. Same with the Bagley Spider Man. I love it, and that's my focus. But I'm realistic in that. Well. I guess I could just dedicate myself solely to getting amazing Spider-Man pages, but I also there's other things out there that I enjoy as well, other heroes and other artists that I like. And so I don't think it's uh, a bad thing to just explore everything that I enjoy. Like I enjoy Nightwing, I enjoy Spider-Man, Moon Knight, Cable, a um, bunch of stuff. Um, so I just try and get, essentially at this point, I get what I like. Um, if something else comes up along the way that really uh, stick, like really cat grabs my attention, then maybe I'll try and go for it. But I just, I just let's see what's available. And um, yeah, and it, and it has evolved, I guess, a little bit. Um, I don't go really for stuff like from the 80s or 70s, not out of personal, any kind of rancor towards that era, but just because it doesn't really capture my attention as uh, later stuff does. Um, but who knows, maybe in 10 years time, I'll be going for 60s and 70s and 80s stuff. Uh -huh. Um, I, can, I constantly see my uh, gallery evolving and my taste and stuff slowly changing in ways that I probably didn't expect for when, I, when I first started collecting. Um, so, yeah, we'll see. So I know you said you don't really sell art. I mean, has there been stuff in your collection that you've had for years? Like, ah, I'm not really interested in that stuff anymore. Um, there's been a couple things that I've sold here and they're not much. But oh. I think, I, uh, except for a few things, I, my general rule of thumb is that if the price is right, it could be sold. I think it's good to be realistic in that sense and not just covet it like um, Scrooge McDuck or whatever in your safe with all your gold treasure. I think if we all need money and there's other things that we want now. Mm -hmm. um, so so if someone has a reasonable strong offer for a page of mine, I'm always willing to listen. 
And I think mm. that's just a healthy way to live. Don't grow too attached mm. to anything. So I fall into that uh, trap a lot. I grow very attached to things. I'm very materialistic. So I'm trying to get out of that. And I think that's a good step for me. And I didn't mean for this to be a therapy session, but that's where it's headed now. <laughs> um, but yeah, just uh, learning to let go of things is, uh, I think, pretty healthy. Well, now since we uh, since you started as a comic collector, have you sold a lot of your comics to fund your your, I have. your art? Okay, I have. Yeah, I've uh, decided I've gotten a lot of stuff sold, and that's I've almost at the point of my comics like just take it all. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I don't. Yeah, the comics that I'm selling these days, I, I, a lot of them I get slabbed and graded. Mm -hmm. Um, and in the early days, like when I was first collecting comics, I would never dream of selling some of the stuff that I have, that I've sold, but now I'm like, there's other things I want more, or I'm not, I'm trying to distance myself, distance myself emotionally from these comics so that I can make money to buy something that I value more. Um, yeah. Hmm. All right, Robert, let's talk about your collection. And they say evolution has... Has it has it changed since it started, and in terms of what you're going after now, as opposed to before? So the the unthemedness of it makes it sort of no, but I do see mm -hmm. differing levels of desires in myself. There was uh, things that I experimented with early on. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I sort of worked through jam pieces at con conventions and saw the the pros and the cons of those and got some that I was very happy with and then that decreased my passion for for doing that further because it is a lot of work to put those together um I did uh, probably less commissions in general and more uh published pages than was initially true and uh, like Carl uh maybe currently swinging more toward older pages more sentimental pages as opposed to uh the the latest pages but none of that is absolute. <laughs> okay. That's so a good Rob note at the end. None of it is absolute. I, I totally agree. Because <laughs> I literally just bought a, a Simone de Mio full issue right before OAX, even though literally it was like a month before where I said, I got to slow down full issues. <laughs> was that the one where uh, they, you, they, they forgot to give you the cover and you had to get it later on? Yes, I, I, I remember what I was saying about that. So yeah, so basically New York Comic Con, I went to go pick it up. I was super excited, told everyone that I had it, picked mm -hmm. it up Simone, walked away. I was like, where's the cover? And then I went back as Simone, turned out his previous art rep had mm -hmm. at her house or something, and it was going under remodeling, and so she forgot to bring it. And then so they ended up having to ship it to me later. And then um, I think um, it was... Uh, I think it wasn't until a while, but it wasn't until like Mikhail said, hey, like, can you bring it over the OAX? And I brought it. And I think I left it at the table for the fellas for a bit. And then when I came back, I think uh, the next day I saw them having Simone de Mio uh, commission. So I'm glad. Uh, hopefully that helped inspire some of the fandom there. Okay. So, so you're you're done. I think I think you said you said that you're done with the complete issues, but now you're looking more into the nostalgia stuff. Um, uh, would you be able to tell you tell us in terms of what where where like your prime nostalgia is, or are you afraid that how many people are gonna raise the price? Yeah, I'm scared. I'm scared there, but I don't mind. I mean, I don't care. Uh, <laughs> I, I definitely am like a big fan of Barry Windsor, but it's really funny because whenever I say Barry Windsor Smith, everyone always talks about Conan. But Conan mm -hmm. isn't really like my nostalgia. Mine was really towards, obviously, Weapon X across the board. Mm -hmm. I'm still looking for a Weapon X page like 30 other people. When when things come up on auctions, everyone's like, who's going for it? Who's going for it? And it turns out everyone's going for it. Uh, and then uh, I love uh, all his runs on Valiant. I feel like mm -hmm. his art was the only art that really moved me during that time. And I felt like when he got a chance to write the stories, those were also really good. Uh, I also liked Rune a lot. Too bad it just didn't run that long, so there was just wasn't mm -hmm. a lot of nostalgia there. Uh, I'm also a fan of Joe Quesada. A lot of his work, uh, I think, more towards uh, the Azrael side. So mm -hmm. I think everyone already knows I collect a lot of Azrael art, but I think that at the end of the day, Joe, Joe Quesada's run on Azrael is probably the ultimate uh, fandom for me. And then it's weird. I've been really fans of like the, the Death of Superman, post-Death of Superman. And even though people make fun of the blue Superman, I thought that was one of my favorite versions of Superman uh, growing up. 
And so, but yeah, I was thinking about Bagley. I had a few pieces of Bagley that I bought for way lower. And I remember right after the pandemic, they totally blew up and people yep. gave me some crazy offers and I had to sell them. And so it was really interesting how Bagley just kind of was, well, you know. I will, I will say about Bagley, um, I remember right before the pandemic, I was talking to this rep about buying various amazing Spider-Man covers from the current series. And he had them for about 3000 or so, which seemed okay then um, then after COVID, they've now gone up to like he sells them for like fifteen thousand. so there's been there's a big uh, price hike uh ever since then uh -huh. just the years uh -huh. yeah um yeah bagley stuff well you know i i always i always favored his 90s stuff i think his newer stuff uh it's 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 nice but for some reason, I, I liked it when he exaggerated all that anatomy from the '90s. So I always, always a big fan of his Spider-Man run as well. Mm. I mean, I mean, Larson would put him and put Spider-Man some of these awkward, uh, you know, positions where his legs go over his neck and things like that. I, I didn't, I didn't want that, but, but Bagley, he he was pretty cool in terms of having, you know, pre, you know, really like elongated legs and and arms. It just looked really cool when Bagley was drawing it. Yeah, speaking of Larson, it's interesting. I, I I remember I felt like he was doing that to follow in the footsteps of McFarlane to mm -hmm. kind of live up to that in between. But I also remember a Nova Spider Man cover that was for like thirty five hundred dollars. And then like I was kind of chewing on it a lot because at the time I just wasn't spending that kind of money. I was in, in my like hundreds stage. Mm -hmm. And then it would have been my first like, you know, major four figure cover. And I hesitated and then in hindsight I totally should have bought it because it was yeah, you know, I, I still would love the cover today if I owned it. I wanted to go for that cover too, and I you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. I do know because I was uh, watching it during that same auction, and I actually went for it, but I got uh, beaten by not too much. How much did it go for? Um, do you remember? Like 35,000, 35, I think. Thirty-five thousand. Yeah. <laughs> it was thirty-five hundred when I when I could have bought it. Yeah, it if you're if you're talking about the ASM, if you're talking about the ASM Bagley Nova cover. Um, oh no, I'm talking about the Eric yeah. Larson one. Okay. The Larson one. Oh, never mind. Yeah, no, yeah, there's yeah. a Bagley Nova uh, Bagley, uh, Spidey uh, cover. Yeah, yeah, it was uh, ninety percent less, but I think mm. it would be, it would probably go for a lot more now. Uh, yeah, um, they all. Yeah, that, that was 2018. That was the summer of 2018. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So I tell you, like, so actually, like, maybe like five years and when I first started collecting, nobody cared about Venom. I don't know why. I mean, he was a big character in the '90s, but in the early 2000s. Venom was pretty much a, a dead IP or something like that. Like, I don't know what they didn't, they, Marvel didn't know what to do with, with, with Eddie Brock. Um, I guess he had a mini series here and there, but Venom was a dead property. Nobody cared about Venom. Um, and then one of the pieces went up for, for on heritage was, uh, was a nine card. It was, it was the, one of those nine card sets with Bagley drawing Venom in each piece. And that was pretty cool. And mm. I, that's, that's one of the pieces I got for like $3,000 back then. Cause nobody cared about Venom. And I think I think I think I saw Venom number one would go for about I think thirty thousand dollars. Obviously now it's probably worth a lot more, but thirty thousand dollars from Venom was kind of surprising back then because nobody cared about him. Do you guys um, feel like the movies had anything to do with it? I don't know if the movies. Well, I, honestly, I, I think the the popularity of Venom is is right now. I mean, I think I think in the recent years he's like no, he was a number one selling comic at one point. Which is yeah, I think really I think the Donny Cade series and the Ryan Stegman working on him together during that era, right before and during COVID, mm -hmm. I think that helped bump the character up because Marvel finally knew what to do with him, and they finally they finally kind of grew to prominence there. Right. So, but Carl, if you're if you're into Electric Superman, now weird thing is I don't see a, a lot of Electric Superman. I thought I would think I would see more, but. I know there's a lot of hatred towards electricity. It's because Carl so, has it. Yeah, so a lot of people hate him, but but I, I I'm a fan. <laughs> I love it. Like, for some reason, I I thought it was kind of a quirky era, and uh -huh. I just like the costume design. But uh, yeah, I don't have okay. a lot of stuff. I, I I I have a couple. Well, I have one piece that I like, but I'm also not trying to buy a ton, and so mm -hmm. I'm not trying to go overdo it. So unless I really like it, I probably won't buy the piece. Because there was something I, I that a think... uh, Wolvie fan had too, but I wasn't a yeah. fan of him wearing a wearing a parachute because i feel like oh, if, okay. if superman could fly why is he wearing a parachute so it, it didn't make sense to me i mean i think when they come up they're not going to come up very expensive you could still buy them at any time but the problem is uh, it, it, it's it's just availability either somebody's probably just holding on to like nobody's going to buy the stuff so they're just going to hold on to it 
Um, but when yeah, the no, I, I bought one recently for, for, for pretty Google reasonable account. price, so it wasn't bad. <laughs> yeah, such a weird story. Like, like I think he had a red version or the blue version, and I and 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 DC was really pumping him up, you know, trying to be like, no, oh, this is such a you know special Superman, but it just flopped. Um, I love the idea too. I love the costumes, and I would love to get some art from that era too. So, mm -hmm. yeah, see, there are fans. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, now that we talked about, uh, we'll talk about some of the plays. So I know you, everybody here, started out with 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 calf. Now, I mean, twenty twenty four. I think I think there's a new art rep every other week, um, and obviously, you know, you know. Uh, Felix, uh, Carl mentioned Felix, and 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 uh, and you know worked with a lot of the reps there. So I guess one question is, where do you, where what kind of platforms really fuel your interest? I mean, other than CAF, but are there other sites that you kind of like you know lurk around and and say, wow, there's some some really good stuff, and that really gets you gets you really energized about art. So uh, Carl, I'll start with you. YouTube for sure. I mean, YouTube has been one of the constant reminders. I mean, I like to like, I don't know about you guys, I bring my iPad everywhere in the house and it's always blasting, my wife hates it. But when she's doing something serious, I'll definitely like turn it down, put my headphones on. But I literally have like cap live blasting wherever I'm going. Or even if I'm traveling on the plane, I always see to see if cap live is going on. And then all, all the art sales, dueling dealers are, are super fun to just listen to. So I'll be like brushing my teeth in the shower and I'll be like listening to dueling dealers. And so I think YouTube number one uh, mm -hmm. and then Instagram as well, because following a lot of the artists on Instagram is kind of fun because you not only see the art for it's in this published form, but you also see a bit of that artist's uh, personality. And I would say the third piece would be uh, comic conventions. So I think, um, yeah, if anything, uh, I've, I've gone to comic cons pretty much every year for, you know, since 2013, you know, obviously I skipped like 20 years and then came back. Uh, but, uh, like something like OAX or even like, um, a Baltimore comic con and, and I'm going to book for heroes con. So those are some of the cons that I'm specifically now going for comic art. So those are, because I feel like when I'm in person, I also do feel like you find new stuff. Uh, even though uh, for some reason, like you should be able to find everything online, but when you're in person flipping through stuff and talking to people, uh, there there seems to be new stuff that that does pop up. So yeah, I, those are the three platforms that matter most to me. Uh, yeah. So question, Carl, how much time do you spend on Instagram versus CAF? Not specifically for art, just just in terms of app usage versus going to web the CAF website. You know, I only go to CAF website to upload stuff. Mm -hmm. and to when I click through to see people stuff. Mm -hmm. So I think I used to browse CAF a lot more, but I don't know if you guys noticed this as well, but when I go to the new section, there's like way, like way too much stuff now. It's like really <laughs> a lot of stuff on sale, a lot of mm -hmm. random, like people will load a hundred images at a time. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like I'm getting like a, a um, like, uh, I guess it's not as curated as it used. And I think it was just naturally curated because there wasn't as many people on it, but now I think it's being used as like a spammy sales filter kind of thing. And so I think I think because of that, I don't spend as much time on like the new new art. But I do sometimes search if I'm looking for something to see what else is out there, or if I'm trying to, you know, someone comes to me with an offer, I will search to see what's like a fair sales data if, if any. Um, but often I think for sales data, I actually go heritage a little bit more because uh, Heritage has some more historical and I could kind of see what people, you know, will really pay for stuff. But yeah, I think um, I think it's been harder for me to go browse on CAF. It's more of a search engine for me. Okay. But I would spend more on Instagram for sure. I think okay. I that's interesting. I mean, it's probably a good problem to have in terms of you get too much art. You get, a CAF gets over a thousand pieces that gets uploaded every day. I mean, that's that's a tremendous amount of art that gets uploaded sure. every day. And and browsing to that does take a commitment of like an hour just to go through all the thousand pieces to see if you missed anything. Um, but you know, Instagram, I, I think I, I think now if you're if you're a modern artist, if you're working in the industry, you're not marketing yourself if you don't have an Instagram account. 
So, so if, if, if you're on Instagram, you're getting the latest update from hundreds of artists. If you're, and you, if you find, I mean, and they're artists all over the world. Some of them are great. I know, I know folks who look for commissions, uh, asking just random artists from on Instagram. Sometimes you find great commissions for like a hundred bucks, but there's always that risk is like, you don't know who's ever bought from this artist before he's draws cool stuff, but is this artist ever going to deliver or is the artist going to take like 10 months to draw your piece? So um, I, I, I've used Instagram more um, today than I, than I've done in the past, but I'm, I'm, I, I, I don't really contact any of the artists, but it is cool to see some of the, some of the new art that people, folks are coming up with and showing previews of the stuff of the covers that they're drawing. But yeah, I, I think I think Instagram is 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 pretty great, but you have you, and it's and you run into artists all the time. You just hit the search button, all of a sudden you get like six new arts, six new artists that you've never seen before. So I think our Instagram is a pretty interesting tool. So uh, yeah, Facebook too. Facebook actually has some good groups as well. I'm seeing yeah. a lot of the dealer, the, the deal or not, not deals. I, I look at that a lot just for the comments. I mm -hmm. think it's hilarious. Uh, and then there's a few other groups that I, that I watch. Yeah, yeah, you, got just, you just got to watch out for the scams on deal or no deal. Um, but on the uh, you know the original art collectors, I think there's there's a really lot of cool posts that people bring up, um, and then that that pretty much in, you know increases my interest in art and making makes me feel I'm still involved with the hobby. So, Simon, what about you? What what are what are some platforms that did that pre, pretty much yeah. like still <laughs> claims of your collecting interest? Uh, Instagram, I'd say that's a big one um facebook i like to just go into those um groups and just see what people are posting or talking about sometimes uh comic book conventions they're a good resource and calf still however i limit my time looking at art or for art with all the above because knowing me as i do if i look too much i start getting jealous and i start getting that itch i still want i start wanting more i'm like oh my god how does so and so have this piece what do they have to do to get this now i need something other that extreme and then it's just an unhealthy cycle <laughs> um so I, I just try to generally just avoid a lot of it a lot of the time unless i'm looking at like a comic link or heritage to see what's coming up in an auction i just quickly go through and see okay that's there or I'll, I'll come back next month when the auction is ending and i'll bid on it um and then maybe ebay if i Again, for favorite artists or favorite characters of mine, I'll just every once in a while just pull it up and just see what's around, um, see if anything uh, is there that I might be interested in. Uh, but those are my favorite platforms. But again, I, I try to limit my interaction with them these days as opposed to when I first started when I was constantly just going crazy looking at everything and just getting jealous and feeling all these kind of mixed emotions <laughs> about art and everything. And we've all been there. We know how it feels. Um, uh, yeah, so that's that's how it is for me. <laughs> yeah. Are, are there any specific like uh, original art websites that that you kind of like just follow in terms of see hey is, is what what new artist does he rep or what do they have new? Uh, art? Yeah, just the usual stuff um, like Felix mm -hmm. or Meet a Man or any of any of them really. Okay, um, just to see uh, what they have. Like I just refresh the page. I have the, all the tabs open. One my uh, open pages down here that I just check every what, like once a month or something or just or a panel page art for example like and I get and I get um I'm subscribed to a lot of these websites so when they have an art a new art drop I get the email so that way I'm not spending every day looking to see if they've put something new up so that also helps limit my time uh -huh. um, and my uh, thirst and hunger for art um, so yeah I have to, I've tried to take a more healthy approach in how I go about uh, looking at art. <laughs> Yeah, I will, I will say that um, honestly, I don't subscribe to every website because the the calf keyword search saves me a lot of time. <laughs> so there's that too. Yeah, yeah, it, it helps me out, so I don't have to browse a lot. Of, I mean, it doesn't work on every site, but every most of the sites that are pretty much attached to a bill site, I mean, the the keyword search is a great feature. I, I wish that. I, could and I had the, I had those I had, I had those keywords. Uh, I did the keyword search when I first started off, but yeah. as my tastes have changed or evolved. Mm -hmm. I've been too lazy to re like readjust it and everything. <laughs> put new way. things in. Um, so Me that's too. Why I, I get a lot of old stuff that I don't I don't really <laughs> like anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Same way. All right, Robert. How about you? What are the platforms that really, you know, you know, light that fire of, of OA for you? So especially as someone who came in really 
ignorant about a lot of the new books and the new artists. Um, when I first started, I did find uh, the, the Thursday Night Calf Lives very valuable in having a curated sample of what's new on calf that, you know, 90% of the artists every week were brand new to me at one point. Uh, you know, I, I knew Art Adams, but oh, look, it's Nick Bradshaw. He's he's kind of like Art Adams. I, I never would have got like this is a Bradshaw here behind me mm. um, that uh, I, I, I discovered him because of uh, uh, the Thursday Calf Live mentioning his work. And so Nicholas Scott would be another one uh, in that category. Um, I'm not on Instagram, I have Facebook. I am on some of the art groups there and have bought stuff from own, unknown artists uh, that just, I liked what they were doing. Um, I do, I, there, were, there was a time early on when I would regularly peruse what's new on CAF, what's new on uh, the artists who were on CAF Live, the, the dealers who were on CAF Live, I mean, Ramita Man and Bashara and, and, uh, and Anthony. Um, I don't, I don't do that as much anymore either. Okay. So I just saw this, uh, this comment here. My wife tolerates my art collecting. Some of it she likes, but as long as I pay, pay for the bills, she doesn't care that much. Does this, is, is this feel the same for you guys? I mean, I'm, I know, uh, uh, Robert and, and, and Carl, I know you both are married. Uh, Simon, I don't know if you're, if you're, if you're married or, no. but, uh, does is does that is that relate to you guys in terms of you know your significant other do they do they even care but the, they know you they probably know you spent a lot of money but do they actually care uh, absolutely, yeah absolutely absolutely yeah yeah, <laughs> the, the, it, yeah. The, absolutely in the sense of yes i mean they they, they care how much uh yeah. you know is is spent and and that comment definitely resonates with me as well and you know it's not a you know when you love someone their happiness has value to you Right. Yeah. So, I mean, it's easy to tolerate. I mean, uh, I think, I think a lot of our significant others, they, 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 they tolerate, but do you, I mean, it, 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 I'm, I'm actually interested when I, when I see someone who's actually has a significant other, who's like really involved with it, really wants to be, you know, part of the auction or, or, or be part of the part of the purchase of, of new art. I think that that's pretty exciting, but I don't have one of those and I don't, I don't, she doesn't have to any, honestly, but uh, you know, having a wife that tolerate, that's good. But if you, if you find the wife that actually like, Hey, let's go after this piece that I don't know how, how that goes. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty funny. I, I think my wife didn't really care, but out of respect when I started going for some of the bigger tier stuff, I, I definitely made sure she knew that what I was getting into and made sure she was okay with it. And, and sometimes I think it's more of a, uh, kind of a self spidey sense, like self regulator to make sure that I'm being talked to by someone I trust. And so by running it by her and me explaining the context as to why I want to spend such money on certain things, uh, you know, depending on where we are in, in, in life, uh, you know, she'll be like, all right, go for it. It's, it's your birthday. Go for it. Or it'll be like, no, I think, I think there's, you know, you're waiting for that deal to happen. So I don't think you should spend that money until that happens. You know, so she's very good about just like speaking some logic into me. And, and there's a few times where I thought I really wanted something, but then she said, why don't you go reread that comic? Cause that's not really Barry Windsor Smith stuff. And I went to go reread it. <laughs> And then I was like, oh, yeah, you're right. I didn't really like that book that much. I just wanted, you know, because of X, Y, Z. Right. And so it was really it's really good just to have a collaborator as yeah. far as my trust I could go to. But for the most part, she could care less. I think I think for little stuff, she mm -hmm. did not really care. But for, for bigger stuff, I do uh, respect to speak to her. Oh, that's pretty cool. She'll tell you why you're interested in that. So she's actually a voice of reasoning and help you help you choose. Voice of reason. I think when, when I get into this FOMO time or when I get into this, like, oh, I got to have something, then uh, then she questions to make sure that I, I want it for the right reasons. You know, oh. I think that, that I'm very lucky in that regard. And then she collects her old stuff, too. So Sure. <laughs> sure. Oh, Rom goes, my wife caught the bug and started collecting herself. You know, maybe on one of these uh, future sessions, I just need to bring in the couples and ask how they make these uh, decisions together. I'm not getting you art. I can you really imagine fun. you find a piece of art and then uh, she didn't tell you. <laughs> yeah, David Mandel and, and and his partner they did that for um, the things dreams are made of. There's a, a uh -huh. husband and wife 
session that the uh, episode and right. they had the wives come on it's really relatable i highly recommend everyone watching that <laughs> all right uh the next topic is about i know some of you have you know like i said you've well carl you you've been here you've been collecting for about six years and 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 uh simon you've been started collecting since 2020 um so uh but you have a few years under the belt what kind of lessons have you learned while you since you started collecting robert I'll, i'm gonna start with you um when i say lessons learned like what did you like like production stats or fakes or blue line art or mono prints what what did you what did you have to learn pretty quickly as as as, as you collected in this hobby those certainly come to the fore one of my uh, first uh, wake up moments was uh, buying a fake kirby commission uh in an auction uh in in, in late 2019 in a in an auction that had was full of other uh reputable pieces and i think the collector who had died and his stuff was being auctioned thought it was a real kirby piece um and he was no longer with us to discuss it unfortunately when it by the time it was uh i was satisfied by talking to other people that it was a fake that i had bought mm. uh so, oh. so 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 be, be wearing uh being leery of commissions mm -hmm. uh i i also once uh, uh bought a mono print not realizing it was a mono print uh and the, 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 it was at a convention and the artist offered to uh, take it back from me when I, he didn't specifically say it was a mon, mono print in, in language that was clear to me. I think he, to him, he thought he was being clear. I don't think he was trying to snow me, mm -hmm. but it, I didn't understand what he was saying. And then uh, later when I did, he offered to buy it back from me, but I liked it enough that I've just kept it, but I have not bought any more. Okay. Um, so question have you learned to, to determine let me, how to figure out if it's been a print or not, whether the it's, it's hand drawn or print? Have you, have you, have you gotten better in that in terms of looking well, for well, the lines? Well, for that, it was simply being educated in the, the euphemisms that are used ah. uh, that, that, that mean it's, it's a mono. Why, why did this piece of original art come with a certificate of authenticity? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. It's an original uh, mono print. That must yes, be really exactly. confusing. <laughs> um, and it said it said one of one on it. I was like, of course, original art's one of one, you know. But <laughs> but um, mm -hmm. uh, so that so that was that was, and then knowing which artists also are are working how. Mm. So you mentioned about buying a fake Kirby. Mm -hmm. How did you? Well, one, where did you where did you get this Kirby? Was it on eBay or? No, it was uh, the it was the. Late 2019, Profiles in History was the company doing an auction of a of a collector's estate. Profiles wow. in History has, has since been sold to Heritage. Right. Um, and I got some other stuff there that was was great, and and it was one of those because it wasn't Heritage, the prices were lower. Uh -huh. um, but then it contained things like like this as well that uh, that slipped in, and I I think I put it on. I forget if it was someone on CAF pointed it out to me, or I was also posting things that I had got on the CGC collectors forum. And someone in one of those two places pointed me to the image uh, from which it had been based. And, uh, and it was pretty evident to me that it, you know, that it was a fake. And they, they showed me some other things about the paper and such that, uh -huh. that uh, convinced me as well. Uh, okay. So, so you had pretty much, you, you, you based your analysis on pretty much what you heard from CGC and what some other folks have told you about the original itself. Okay. Yes. The, the kind of paper it was on the, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but, but mainly the thing that clinched it was seeing an image in the Kirby collector that it mm -hmm. had obviously been based on, but was not that same character, but it was in that exact same pose, which I know Kirby would not have just exactly duplicated the certain details of that pose on, on another character. Yeah. Uh, oh, wow. Looks like uh, someone else says uh, I bought a few things from profiles that turn out fake. Wow. That's uh, pretty scary. I never bought from profiles, but that's 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 a shame that they <laughs> they're not able to authenticate. But I know and, and Robert, uh, to, so you don't feel bad. I think when someone buys a Kirby, especially the, the, the stuff, my understanding from his later later in life, or like from the 90s, it was, it was from, 90s, from the 80s. Some of that stuff, there's 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 always multiple opinions on whether it's real or not. Because even when the stuff, my understanding when it went when it went to auction for like Sotheby's, uh, some folks said Kirby didn't draw it. That was like he had assistants or he had Raw's 
fake the signature. I know there there was a lot of uh, controversy regarding was did did Jack actually put that paper on his board and actually draw it. Um, there's like if you ever saw Jack's draw, drawing board, it was so dirty that any piece of art on it would be would have lots of uh, blemishes all all over it. Um, this but one if was you look totally at some clean. of his commissions, it would be fully clean. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so. I know, I know, it gets a little gray area when you when you buy Kirby from those uh, from the late nine where where he was drawing from the late nineties because I think a lot of folks weren't sure about it. And then, um, and you said you posted on CAF. I think I think someone like Eric Larson has probably touched more Jack Kirby art than anybody else in the world, and he mm -hmm. owns complete issues of it. I mean, he has a good feel on whether uh, a piece was actually you know actually drawn by Jack. So. Um, yeah, I mean, so so I'm saying a lot of people would, would could make that mistake, but then when it gets to the late '90s, uh, there's a lot of different people who question whether or not Jack actually drew those pieces. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, I guess uh, Simon, I'll go to you. What are some quick yeah. lessons learned that you had to learn in the course of you know since 2020 when you in this hobby? So thankfully, when I first went uh, discovered CAF, I just started to reach out to people and talk about uh, how the fact that I'm a new collector, if there's any advice they could um, provide me. And through that, I found a few mentors, art collecting mentors that really helped um, guide me and I guess uh, answered all my questions, or a lot of questions like with blue lines and stuff like that I didn't really understand. Mm -hmm. um, but a big uh, lesson learned was in an auction for that Spider-Man page we talked about, uh, Big Venom, Spidey Splash, and how it's important to read the fine print of the description. Otherwise, you could receive a very nasty surprise in the mail. Um, because I guess the story is such, I'll make it very quick. I did win that page initially. I got it from Heritage. It came back not in the description that they had advertised, and there's a lot of issues with it. It was, it was literally glued onto like styrofoam or something. Wow. And all these, and it was all wavy and the glue that it had been glued with had kind of started to bubble up in the pages and everything. And the description had been like in fine condition or something like that, which in my mind didn't really, I don't, I don't know. I, don't, I didn't really pay attention to that. Um, it had been framed. It, it had been all these th issues that then weren't really in the description and should have been. And also I, I should have asked and inquired since I was really into this page what these little things meant, but I didn't. So what proceeded was about a month, a uh, month and a half long debate with Heritage about this piece um, and how I didn't want it because it didn't match up with what they had advertised. Um, finally, I did get my money back. I sent it back to them and I guess somebody else bought it shortly thereafter uh, at another auction because they put it right back up. Um, which is not to say anything about heritage one way or the other, um, but that was just what happened to me. I'm just recounting the facts as I remember them. Um, so yeah, read the fine print. Uh, if you if you have any questions about the condition of something, ask. Um, ask for specifics. Um, otherwise, you could end up spending lots of money on something and then having them try to refute you and be like that's your problem, and not wanting to do anything about it. Um, so yeah. So, um, sorry. What, what what page was it that that uh, it was from Amazing Spider-Man three seventy four? Okay, it was uh, pretty much a full splash of Venom punching Spider-Man in the middle of the air. Okay, um, the promotional image or whatever image they used on their website uh, that we would all see when we we're uh, bidding on it looked phenomenal, but the actual page once it was received was not in such pristine condition. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, uh, it gets really, it really, some, some folks have a different threshold in terms of what they'll tolerate in terms of condition. Yeah. Now, if they say it's, it's a mountain on the board, well, that, that's a, that's a problem because I don't have a way to remove the glue from the page, from the board. I, I took to it to professional, I took it to, I took it to a professional framer that same day. I opened it up and I'm like, what the heck is this? I took it and they're like we can't really do anything about it. there's somebody else we can recommend that you can possibly get it like saved from and then i'm like the thing is literally bubbling um this is not what i paid for and this is not what was advertised mm -hmm. so just have learning to deal with that and have patience but also um stand your ground also if somebody says like initially when i tried to refute it with them they're like well that's your problem we don't 
we mm-hmm. can't do anything about it. To which I said, no. Um, and then you just have to, yeah, you have to be patient, but also you have to know um, your own worth and what you're willing to fight for and do mm-hmm. so in a respectful manner. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, I would, I would say, you know, I, I, I started collecting comics before I, st- I, I, I bought art. I didn't grade, I didn't grade my comics cause I wasn't there yet, but I was almost anal retentive about the condition of the comics. Actually, when I got to art, I thought it was a pretty liberating cause I actually stopped caring about the condition of the art. As long as it wasn't torn, I was, I was fine. I mean, no water damage. It wasn't no tear. I was kind of, I was, I was pretty okay with the art then. I mean, the thing if you mount it, if it's glued to a board, I mean, I, I can't I can't separate it unless I take it to a restore and that can cost a lot of money. And plus I'm pretty much impacting the the page itself if you take it take it to a restore. Um but yeah, I mean I mean I get your point. You got to redefine print because I remember, there was one time when I was bidding on Heritage. I bid $3,000 on a cover. I didn't read I didn't read I didn't realize I was bidding on a recreation. <laughs> So, so after I bid, I was like, oh shit, this is it's a recreation. Of course, someone outbid me. And I was like relieved because I, I don't think the other person read it was a recreation either. <laughs> so so um so so yes, you gotta read the fine print. I think there was a there was a time uh like like maybe maybe two Wednesdays ago that I that I was uh looking at bidding on something, I forgot to read the fine print and, and I almost um, I, I almost overbidded. Um, but uh, luckily, I, I caught myself. Uh, but yes, Heritage. It's not like they're. I think Heritage is actually better than most. This is my experience in terms of trying to accurately describe the uh, art. They they would tell you if it's mounted on the board, but I don't know. Maybe maybe sometimes it's framed. They don't check if it's actually mounted. Yeah, they, they um, didn't check. Yeah. Yeah, um, but. Uh, I know there are times they pull stuff from auction because they 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 incorrectly or th- they incorrectly describe it or, I mean, or they they'll update the description. But for the most part, they 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 try to accurately describe because I, they they'll know that people will complain and return if uh, <laughs> they, they, people bought something they that wasn't described. Um, yeah. All right, uh, Carl, I'll go next to you. What are some lessons learned since you started the hobby? Well, um, have a theme, but also be more specific. Because I think uh-huh. when I first started collecting, I was like, oh, I'm going to collect Wolverine. I'm going to collect Deadpool. And I literally just bought whatever was Deadpool Wolverine that showed up. And so I was doing a lot of like, I mean, also it wasn't like the super expensive stuff. It was just like brand new modern art. Like anyone I would run into selling a piece for 50 bucks, 100 bucks, I would just buy it just because it's part of my theme. So definitely be more specific um, when it comes to the theme, because after a while it just gets too much, and it's almost like going on YouTube. Like, mm-hmm. you know, your your I think the, your weakest piece become like you know the, become it weighs down the rest of the collection. So I had to kind of move a lot of that stuff. At some point, I think I sent a bunch of them to like Comic Link, a bunch of them to Heritage Auction, and and just got rid of them. Uh, and then the other thing is like FOMO. Don't don't get caught up by FOMO because. I, don't, I think we've all been there where like um, a new comics coming out. The artist is a great artist. He's working on a new comic and this comic's about to sell a million issues. Then when, you know, the pages drop, all of us trying to like fight for the pages. And I definitely have like one, a few of those pages where I'm kind of like, why did I even buy this? I don't even like really like this character. I just bought it because this art, this artist, there's all this like hype around the issue. Right. So there's that. And then uh, I think lastly, just just um, yeah, I think I think um, Robert said this earlier. Like, there's always more art, so don't don't feel too bad about missing out on something because um, there'll always be another piece that that just comes up that will be just as good if not better, and it'll make you wish you you save your money. But yeah, I definitely have a few that you know that got away that I still think about. But you know, definitely uh, know that there's always more art. Huh. But so your suggestion is have a sort of some sort of focus because... yeah focus and restrictions kind of like mm-hmm. be, be specific okay. i think it's not even focused because okay. i think i thought i was focused but i wasn't really focused i was i was mm-hmm. literally just you know co- collecting like i collect x-men so i buy anything that's cool from x-men that would show mm-hmm. up from like any artist but then i think being specific meaning you know i want covers of a of deadpool from the 90s 
you know, obviously that's like impossible to, to get from, from Rob Liefeld, you know, like mm-hmm. be more specific as to yeah. like what you're looking for. What, I mean, obviously when I named that example, mm-hmm. not only will it slow you down dramatically and how fast you purchase things, but it gives you a really strong filter as to like what fits and what doesn't into your collection. So I think that's, that's definitely one big lesson I've learned. Yeah. You know, I, I, I tell people, I wish I can be, you know, collect like Mike, Mike Berkey. Mike Berkey, you know, and and what I'm hearing in the 90s, his stories of the 90s, he pretty much only wanted John John Romita Spider-Man. Anything wow. else he touched, he he, he he sold. He's like, he's like, got it. I know I can make a buck off it. I'm gonna sell it. John Romita Sr. Spider-Man was the only stuff he kept. And 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 the value of that just kept growing, growing, but but he had no interest in in, in keeping the other stuff, <laughs> unless unless he knew the the I guess I guess un, unless he knew that the stuff was actually going to be escalating in value pretty quickly over the years. Um, but but he had no interest in keeping the stuff. So 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 it was it was it was free for him to just let go. He had no emotional attachment to like selling the stuff that wasn't uh, John Romita Senior Spider Man. Um, obviously over the years he's, he's, he's sold more and more of his core collection, but, uh, you know, I, I, I wish I could do that and say, I'm only going to click from this specific artist for this specific title, but I read too many comics as a kid and I loved them all. So. That's ultra focused. That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, at, at the end of the at the at the end of the day, you can't take it with you. Yeah. Um, I'm just yeah. thinking about uh, to you talking about Mike and um, people like that, or any of us. We covet a lot of our the pieces we have, but when we're gone, we're gone, and uh-huh. there's other things we'd like to uh, buy or other pieces we'd like to have. So just remembering that it's not going to be with us forever, no matter how closely we guard it. Hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I know we talked about lessons learned. I guess we can do a quick one. Is this what are some lessons learned you learn about commissions? <laughs> so, so Simon, do you have you do you have you done commissions before? Oh yeah, uh, I think I said earlier before yeah. I even discovered original art, I was yeah. very much into commissions. Uh, whenever I went to any Comic Con, I'd hunt mm-hmm. down the artists that I like um, and just ask for commissions. Because again, I wasn't really aware that you could buy uh, the art itself. So that was for me uh, the step above the comics. Um, so yeah, I have a ton of commissions I've gone over the years. Um, these days, I only reserve uh, my commission spots, as it were, for like when I go to Lake Como or somewhere like that, where I know like really top tier artists who I enjoy are going to be, and maybe I get one or two of them there. And and yeah, so I, I try not to get too many these days. So I can use those same funds for uh, original art, original published art. Oh, so you pretty much had pretty much okay, pretty good experiences with with. Uh collecting commissions mm-hmm. but it's just yeah. a matter of i'd rather have that money focus on the, the original pages yeah. okay yeah. right robert what what have you learned anything about commissions over the years uh i would i haven't gotten that many um <laughs> uh, but uh yeah. the the thing things that i did learn as that as a newbie that i would have told my five year later self is um uh, plan them ahead of the convention. You'll get a better piece than uh-huh. trying to do one at the commission. And if you do something at the commission, uh, like especially when I was trying to do the jam pieces, I had very unrealistic expectations of turnaround time for the artists, and that uh, that that made, was stressful on me and perhaps stressful on them as I you know, came to their table repeated times, uh, finding they weren't done yet. Uh, and so, you know, to plan if I'm going to do something like that in the future, which I do have a jam piece that I'm, I'm working on, just to be willing to get one artist per show um, and not 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 push it. You know, there's there's more shows in the future. Oh, okay, great, Carl. Any lessons learned about commissions? Yeah, I used to get a lot. Um, now I like um, sketchbooks. So uh-huh. um, I was in in Baltimore Comic Con, and one of our fellow cap members was there, and he was sharing about his sketchbooks adventures and i looked through them and i was like this is kind of cool just to have them all collected in one place and to be able to care of you everywhere and so since then i've, I've started a couple of sketchbooks and that's majority of my my commissions these days but other than that i, I did a good amount during pandemic i think all mm-hmm. of us were like super bored and so we all like jump on these lists and so mm-hmm. a pretty healthy amount of commissions on my calf uh, okay and they probably- all turn out pretty well yeah, I think so for the most part. I think uh, okay. you know, you, I, I think uh, especially during pandemic, I felt like the artists weren't rushing. I mean, they all had a lot more sure. time on their hands. Uh, I'm actually looking forward uh, 
to my Trad More commission that I, I jumped on the list for at the beginning of 2020. And so oh, I know okay. that's been a low churning list, but that's mm -hmm. one that I, I have high hopes for. Yeah, I don't I don't follow Trad More. Has, has he done like a commission in the last year or two? No, I think he's, he's put out once a year. He took a pretty substantial list at the beginning of uh, oh. 2020. And I think he's been so busy ever since that mm -hmm. he maybe do one or two a year. So right. I think he's just working off that list. Uh, how many how many uh, sketchbooks do you have? I only have two. Uh, one of them is a Joker sketchbook. Mm -hmm. So a lot of those you can see on my calf already. I have three more I haven't uploaded yet. And mm -hmm. then um, I also have a OG Valiant by OG Valiant Artist sketchbook, which I'm starting to lose, lose faith on because I'm realizing there isn't that many OG Valiant <laughs> artists left. That still goes to shows. And then uh, I was able to get Bob Lane to do it for me at OAX. And so I might at some point transition that to just general Valiant art because I don't think I'm going to be able to get, you know, the OG artist uh, into the book. I mean, there's a chance you, maybe you might find Barry Windsor Smith to, to draw something in that. Yeah. Um, I don't even think he leaves his house anymore. So I, I think it'll be hard. <laughs> so yeah, fortunately, uh, yeah, that will be, that will be the dream. If I can yeah. get him to do the book, I'm done. <laughs> yeah and i think you might have to repeat have the give it back to some of the same artists to you know fill it out because uh, i hope there are not too many pages in that book there's a good amount of pages that's the problem if i got that's what i'm saying if Barry Windsor yeah. hit it i'm not hanging that thing out ever again <laughs> <laughs> all right so for the last topic of the day um and uh i guess you guys all have a couple years under your belt do you feel that as your as part of your collecting, are you is there, is there some competitiveness with with any of the peers that you see? I know I mean you go on cab, you can see amazing pieces, and been, and also on Facebook you see amazing pieces. Is it, when you're while you're collecting, are you are you are you getting competitive? So uh, I'll, I'll I'll start with you, Robert. <laughs> um, it's a mix, you know. I as I think it was Simon who said that sometimes you just there's a piece that you liked, but it goes to somebody else and you see it on their calf. And, uh, and I enjoyed being able to see it there. Um, mm -hmm. especially if I get to you know, meet them and even see it in person, perhaps at some, some event. Uh, so, uh, I, I enjoy the collegiality of, mm -hmm. of our community. And so being, I don't want to be too cutthroat, uh, yeah. with, with people that I want to be enjoying their art and having them enjoy my art as well. Ah. It's not worth breaking relationships. Got it. Simon, what about you? Uh, there are moments when I get very competitive and very like, oh my God, how'd you guys get that? Or how did somebody get uh, mm -hmm. this cover or this page? Usually it's kind of some kind of fascination, like, because they'll post some kind of piece. I'm like, I didn't see that at any uh, auctions site or anything. So how did they get that? That's really, that's crazy that they're able to find it. And I'm like, well, then I can compare that to my own collection. Like then I start to go down a rabbit hole, like, oh my God, my collection isn't good enough. I have to get more. I have to spend more money to get really big pieces so that I can finally be where I want to be. But, and then that's why I kind of distanced myself as we talked about earlier from all the other like um, ways to look at art, like Instagram and all that stuff, because then I just go down that rabbit hole. So I try in these days just to appreciate what I see out there or just appreciate what I can get and not try to think about it too much. Um, sometimes it's hard because sometimes you see something so iconic that you're just like, oh my god, I, how, why, why did they, why did they get it? <laughs> um, I want it. That should be mine. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so it's just a you just have to kind of balance that. I think we all feel some pangs of jealousy at times, or it, it's just a mixture of emotions one goes through. Really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think it's pretty easy to be jealous in this. I mean, what I learned very quickly in this hobby is that there's always a lot of collectors above us <laughs> who are collecting in a different tier than us and then getting the stuff that we really want. So, uh, Carl, what about you? I mean, any, any, do you feel any competitiveness when you, when you, when you buy art? Only when I used to chase the Felix drops, when I used to wake <laughs> up, time yeah. everything, multiple screens and have the world clock going. And then I'm like jumping for the pages and then, yeah. And, and for the most part, a lot of stuff I, I went for, it mm -hmm. would just, disappear i don't even see who got them but i would say like those were the moments i felt very competitive but otherwise these days what's been great about the cap community is i'm in a number of chats now 
and I kind of know who collects similar stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I would literally just like, if something came on auction, I will just, Hey, are you looking at this? And then they'll say yes or no. If they, yeah, they, you know, if they say yes, I'll be like, Hey, like let's have a discussion. Cause I don't want to like bid each other up. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we'll just kind of discuss like, you know, how bad each other wants it and, mm -hmm. and how bad, how much you were going to go for, like what's your cap. And then at some point I'll either, you know, back off or, uh, the other person may be, oh, you know, you want it more, but it's been very civil. And I think in that way, it's making collecting much more fun because now I kind of, uh, have built up some credit where I've, I've backed up from some pieces where other folks, I think in the future, I can ask for a favor. Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah, just, just having that type of collaborative collecting effort has made it a lot more fun. And then I think. I have had friends now also send me stuff that they know I like, mm -hmm. uh, know that I would go after, uh, that I probably would have missed if not for the community. And so I, I'm definitely a lot less competitive and I've definitely come to this point in my life where I feel like I, I just can't have everything. And so, you know, I'll just get what I can as, as, as it comes. And so, yeah, it's been cool because, you know, prices were getting kind of crazy the last few years and then this year has softened a bit. And so, mm -hmm. It, it created a lot more possibilities than than you know where we thought things were going last year, but it's still really expensive. So uh, I've slowed down quite a bit, and having a community really helps helps that. So Carl, have you had your has your wife ever helped you with a Felix drop? No, she will never do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she she should think she, she, she I, just thinks I, the whole thing is silly. Yeah, I did it once for a, a Dara. A Dara it's a Darren Daniel Warren Johnson uh, commission. And it was just right. like, it was stressful just like right before like the time and yeah. then like the server crashes <laughs> and then, and then you're able to put your request in and then you have to wait like for time to know. And you just stressed out to know whether or not you want a piece. So I said, not doing a, I'm not doing a drop ever again. <laughs> yeah, just, I was really like, oh, this is it. not for me. That's I, it's just, I don't need that kind of stress in my life. Yeah, it's so. stressful just waiting to see if you're rejected or not, you know. <laughs> and then the longer you, the funniest thing, the rejections come fa faster. So like, mm -hmm. if you don't get rejection within the first hour, you're like, yes, I might get it. And then sometimes it'll come two hours later. Like, oh, sorry, it's gone. Like, oh. Yeah, yeah. I, I, Carl, I think I think you touched some really important pieces. So that I, I should have probably brought as a question that, that when you're networking, especially now when you're on there's there's social media. Um, that helps that helps everybody it helps yourself mm -hmm. and and you're able to find more pieces out there because everybody will send you tips and you get to go back and forth and talk about whether you know how far you're going to go to get the to get a piece um but having 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 that network you'll you'll probably you know you might have a friend who's who's probably looking to sell some pieces and and some of those pieces you've been wanting for like 20 years so so it helps to have that network to help you out Sometimes they know a tip. Sometimes they have uh, they're, they're pretty close to some reps or some artists, and they can hook you up. So having that network does does pretty help everybody. And that's probably something I recommend for folks, you know, early on is is to build your network of collectors. Um, but all right, so that's the end of the of of this collectors conversation i want to thank all my panelists i hope you all enjoyed this 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 conversation i think it's it, i i i love it that that i got i got you guys are all fairly new and, and and trying to understand how your mindset was when when you started and how it's how your collection have grown since then or how your mindset has changed uh since then but uh yeah um i also say that you know with my network I always feel that we're a family. So when the when when one of them gets a piece, I feel like I don't have to go for it. <laughs> like if, if if I see a piece, it's like I might want it. But hey, if I have if I have a friend who wants it more than I do, I'll let him take it, and I'll I'll just I'll just wait for the piece that I really want. So yeah, but, all thanks, right, Larry. Thanks, what a Larry. Great Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Everybody have a great night, and uh, probably see you next month. Thank you. Thanks, folks. Thank you.